Hello everyone, welcome to a brand new video on the Football Stadium Show YouTube channel. The last week I explored the story of Wanderers FC, the team that won 5 FA Cups and helped found the FA in just 28 years of existence back in the 1800s. The team was reformed over a century later in 2009 as a Sunday league side by Mark Wilson and now playing Crystal Palace. Today I'll be speaking to Mark about how and why he reformed the Wanderers and we'll be asking some more general questions about the running and life of a Sunday league team. But before we start, I highly recommend watching the original video if you haven't already and there'll be a link to that down in the description below. Now, let's get started. How did you find out about the club and why did you choose to reform them? We were running a seven-a-side kickabout in um, Kennington and that was sort of February 2009, I think. And a few of the guys were just interested in playing an 11-a-side game. So it sort of made sense to try and find if there was a team... I guess, near us locally. Um, and I looked online for, you know, 11 aside teams, football teams in Kennington. And all that came up all the time was was Wanderers. So uh, I looked into it and found out they didn't exist and, and um, discovered that some people had started a conversation on a family history or genealogy website um, to try and chat to the, the woman who was the great granddaughter of John Alcock, who's one of the two brothers that, that founded the club. Um, and so I got in touch with her through this genealogy website um, and said, would it be OK with you if we reformed the club? And she was really happy and really supportive. Uh, um, and subsequently, her son played a couple of games for us as well. And once you brought back the history of the club, how was life then? Because I know uh, you contacted apparently a couple of other teams who were big back in the 1800s. Yeah, so um, we thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could play some of the teams we played in the past? Um, so we got in touch with a handful and, and Oxford University were the, one of the first that came back and invited, to, uh, we invited us up for a game. So that was a great experience. And, you know, the, the scoreline was not quite very, it wasn't very flattering, but it was a great experience. Um, you know, if you, we, we turned up thinking, having been kind of persuaded to play against their old boys team, um, and it was their first team, like their Oxford University, 20 years old, fit as a fiddle mm. players um, who ran rings around us with an average age of you know 35. And we played um, the Royal Engineers that year as well. So in the first year we played uh, Oxford University, UNICEF and um, Royal Engineers. And they, again, they were nice enough to, to invite us to their uh, their home pitch in, in Essex. So we had a couple of away days in the first season. Um, we've subsequently played teams like Clapham Rovers, uh, who also reformed. Uh, we've played teams like, um, tell you who the teams we've played who are in the original FA Cup. Uh, right, well, Rygate Priory, we played a few times recently uh, and had never played them in the 1800s, which is quite unusual. Um, we had a game against uh, Upton Park because they've they've reformed as a kind of, um, I guess, a, the Harlem Globetrotters of the Southern Amateur League, if you like. So they pick all the best players from... Uh, that was a very high standard. Um, so we played a few a few clubs, but I guess you know there's only so many teams you can really play because there were so few of them back in the day, and, and not all of them are still around. And in the ten plus years you've existed, what has the the running of the Sunday League team been like? How many teams have you played? Have you won anything? Have you made your way up the leagues? So in our first our first season, we had no kind of expectations. We'd already said we we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. We we got promoted in our second season. Um, we only went uh, we only missed out on the title and goal difference. Um, we then won that was junior division four. We then won junior division three in the next year, uh, and then came I think second or third in junior division two and went up again. So we had three promotions in three seasons. Um, in that time, we then set up our reserves. Uh, they subsequently got to a cup final, um, lost to AFC Ewell, I think. Um, so the the twos and the ones in on the Saturday side have have kind of bobbed around. They've you know got to a few semis, uh, um, you know promotions, one relegation. Uh, so not doing badly, but we could we could always do with a bit more quality because I goal is really to move up those leagues um our women's team were up until well they were in they're in a uh, a friendly league that existed for a few years before folding uh, about i guess six or seven years ago then they were in the greater london women's football league uh, 
um, which is the kind of lowest tier of, of the pyramid in women's football. Um, but you're playing teams like Hampton, Richmond Borough, Millwall, Charlton, you know, like proper clubs. So you can't ever really compete um, with a lot of those teams. But we managed just before COVID, I think we were on track to get promoted, um, which would have been astounding, like absolutely incredible. Uh, but then COVID hit and we ended up losing some players to uh, Tottenham and to uh, moving into Canada and stuff like that. So we had a bit of a, a blow and had to completely rebuild the squad. Um, most players, I think, joined our coach who went to work with Ballon. Um, so, yeah, a bit of a bit of a shame that we couldn't follow that up. And I got a comment on that video last week saying that because of your history, you deserve some sort of cash injection or you deserve some sort of bump up. Do you think that's the case? And also about that history, do you now own this? You know, are you recognised by the FA as the Wanderers or is it just you call yourselves that? Sure. Well, um, when we reformed, one of the first things I did was to, to check in with the London FA to be like, well, do we do we owe you any money? Because with compound interest, we'd be in millions of, of debt. Right. So I checked in with, with them and they were like, no, no, you're, you're fine. Um, I checked in with the FA uh, and their legal team sent us some letters and were like, oh, you, you can't do this. And it was like, OK, well, fair enough. If you don't want to do it, we won't do it. But we're going to do it. And what are you going to sue us for? Some cones and balls? Um, so they sent us a couple of letters and we basically ignored them. So, well, OK, if you've got a problem with us saying that we're the Reformation with the endorsement of the family who originally founded the club, then, OK, let's go court over it. They never followed up on that. And in the years since then, so that was in 2009, in the years since then, we've been involved in... Um, the FA Cup uh, restaging at uh, the Oval with Royal Engineers in 2012, when we had the chairman of the FA come down, and uh, it was uh, David Bernstein at the time. We've had uh, invitations to be part of the FA Cup um, trail. They basically took the trophy on the back of a big truck and drove it around the country, and we were part of the launch at the Oval. And then I've been invited end up last season walking out on the pitch at Wembley before the FA Cup final, holding the trophy. So I'd say they're pretty much behind us. I think there's nothing to there's You can't get any more endorsement than that, I would say. Um, and I think in terms of your, your point, a question about the, the cash injection, I think that's an interesting one. Like our objective has always been to raise money through, through the typical means, like players paying to play, um, through any fundraising events we do, um, maybe merchandise or whatever, but that money goes to charity. So we don't keep any of the profits. And that's always been the case since we reformed. More generally, what is the running of a club like Wanderers uh, like? So what are the costs, the day-to-day -day administration, things like that? And yeah. talking about yourself as well, what is your position at the club at the moment? So I'm, I've been club secretary since 2009. Um, and that entails essentially... Quite a lot of things. Um, so I'm the treasurer as well as the club secretary, mostly because nobody else wants to do it, to be honest. Uh, but it's a case of all the administrative paperwork has to be created. The the structure of the club as an organisation, so whether that's a community amateur sports club, whether it's a charity, whether it's a business, uh, has to be decided by our club committee. Um, so I have to encourage people to participate in that on a voluntary basis. So we, we try and create... Um, a group of people who are all driven towards making the club as a success. Um, so that includes things like appointing managers and coaches and volunteers to different roles, um, laying out the, the kind of expectations of those roles. Um, I do quite a lot of engagement with, with new players. So when they contact us, it goes to me and then I try and pass them into the right teams or get them to go along to events. Um, there's social events that, you know, I sort of get involved with, but the thing at the moment, I mean, it's been this, this case for a while is I've always thought that, you know, if I if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, you don't want wanderers to disappear. So it, it's about creating uh, structures and environment that provides long term security for the club. And I and what I've noticed is over the past years, there's always been a handful of teams in each league that, that fold. Right. So we've we got relegated one like this the one time we relegated a couple of years ago because three clubs folded and it meant well we we'd already beaten and we're well above them but because of the time of year they folded that meant we ended up bottom um which is you know unfortunate but it's just the way it is at that level um and there's statistics that say that every year around 20% of men's 11 aside teams fold 
you say you're living in Germany. Do you think that almost separates you from the team a bit? Because you're like you say, you're not involved in uh, what goes on on the pitch, the pitch stuff. Would you prefer to be involved in the on the pitch stuff more, or is that not for you at all? I don't feel distant from the team at all because I'm still friends with a lot of people there. Um, I know most of them. There's obviously a few guys who come in that I haven't met yet, um, but that's that could be the same with a, a, any kind of chairman or secretary of a club with more than four or five teams. Um, so I don't feel like I'm not a part of it. I mean, all the you know all the chats on WhatsApp and stuff, and I get involved as much as I'm as I'm allowed to. I think most managers or, or volunteers will always have uh, a part that wants to be on the pitch. And if you're if you're a player like I am, where you want to influence the the match, you're watching it, and you, you know this you know, the idea of kicking every ball and going up for every header and making every tackle and stuff. You look at those things. Yeah, I want to do that. But then, especially in a position that I'm in, I've not played for the men's first team for you know 15 years because, in my view, I shouldn't. You know, I've never I never started playing football until I was probably 14. So any misplaced aspirations of going anything above the level I'm at now is is would be ridiculous. So I've never had aspirations of that. I've never had any, you know, no, I, don't, I don't have any compliments about being a great footballer. I wouldn't expect any. But I look at it and go, if I was going to reform this club, it should be that the play, like we're bringing in players who are better than me and, and pushing me out of the team. And I think even, you know, I've played a few games this season that's closing now for the seconds when I've been back. And... You know, there are players far better than me. And you think, great, this is this is perfect. I'd I'd like I'm I'm one of those guys who would like to see much better players coming in, kind of forcing the older players, you know, the more experienced players out, because most of them are mature enough to go, This is great. I love a bit of competition. Um, and I think it's really only players who are somewhat immature or perhaps um less experienced who who fear better players coming in. Um, I mean, obviously, as an Arsenal fan, you can see when you have, you know, new players coming through, especially the, the young players from the academy or maybe, uh, you know, signings from abroad. The older players like the Granite Jackers are the ones who go, great, let's let's show them how to play football. Let's really lift the game together. Um, and I can imagine that Arteta's doing the same thing on the sidelines. He's, you know, kind of twitching with excitement when the ball's in an area he thinks he would have been been playing in. So, yeah, yeah I don't I don't feel distant from it i feel like i've got the advantage of more time here um that allows me to do more for the club and i think it's just part and parcel of, of the development and the growth of the game is that um a lot of this stuff can be done remotely so i can i can access all of the fa systems online um i can all of the league and, and cup um information that we need we can access online so it's brilliant and i, I feel like um a lot of a lot of clubs aren't necessarily maximizing their ability to do things remotely um such as things like even you know your admin uh around, around financing for example or you know networking and stuff it's easy to do online um i, I think people should should try and embrace it more but maybe they will so and you mentioned the arsenal project would you is your the wondrous project is it bringing in younger players um or is it you know more about experience i mean it's a really timely timely question because I don't think we necessarily focus on young or old players. I think what our focus is going to be, and we've, we've set out a vision, um, which is to, to positively benefit the communities we operate in through football. And part of that is we really want to attract players who fit one or more of the four kind of mentalities that we believe defines what a wanderer is. So the four mentalities are really being an altruist or someone who, gives to others who are in most need you have already maybe run a, a you know done a run for charity or you you are a giver you a person who helps others in need right we want idealists so people who go i don't like time wasting in football i don't like diving i don't like um you know spectators screaming at players i want to create of an environment for a football to exist that is as good as it can be so that would be the kind of players who play in the right spirit that even if you've gone toe to toe nose to nose with an opposition player in during the game afterwards you shake their hand so that mentality we also then want the other two were um guardians so people who are going to protect the wanderer's identity and try and understand its history 
and buy into that and go, oh, actually, this is quite a big deal. Um, and then winners. So crucially, we want people who are willing to turn up early for matches, who are willing to drive everybody forwards without dragging them down. So we we all progress through this sort of, I guess in, in teaching, we call it, uh, what was it called? Uh, warm strict is this concept where you're you're nice to people but you don't you don't sugarcoat it so if you've you're a winning mentality for me would be some would be players who go look you're not playing very well today that pass should have gone there i want to see you try it next time because i know you can do it finding the right words and the right body language and the right communication styles so those those four mentalities are what defines a wanderer so you have to have two out of four to really fit in at Wanderers, right? So you could do zero kickups, but have all four of those attributes. We want you. Looking forward to the future, of course, you said earlier in 20 years' time, maybe you want to be at the National League South level. But thinking shorter term, maybe the next five years, where can you see the club? The the idea for us is that in the next five years, we want to see our women's team um, competing in a competitive league. Uh, we want to see our Sunday League team have, have risen up a couple of divisions and still offering something different. Um, so not just the Saturday players playing on Sundays as well, but a different core of players. You know, So we've got three distinct men's teams and a and women's team. I think we want to see the first back in intermediate football pushing into the Surrey Elite League. Um, we'd like to see our twos keeping pace with them and maybe from where they are now, I think it's Div 4 or 5. Again, a couple of promotions. So I think in five years, ideally... Um, all three men's teams will have seen themselves go up one, maybe two levels um, to maintain this this you know this drive that we have for us to be successful and for us to kind of validate all the effort we're putting in this closed season to make sure that you know the funding model is right, the business model is right, the right people are in the right positions, the um, the whole way we run things like training is done in a way that makes people actually smile and turn up and enjoy themselves. And improvement comes second off the back of that. And uh, one final thing, if you could give everyone watching a message about Wanderers and about the club as a whole and sum it up, what would you say? I think we, we've we sort of launched the hashtag years ago, the World's Club, because we've had so many players from different countries um, and we've been around the world playing football against different levels of teams. Um, I would say that I, I would love people to think of Wanderers as their backup team. Um, as the team they look for the results for after final score because of the things that we we stand for. So we stand for inclusivity, diversity and doing the right thing. So we stand for a lot of very, very positive, um, impactful concepts around society. But we also put our, our money where our mouth is. We, we raise money for charity every year. We try and help people who are less advantaged through offering them free places of training and on matches. So the things we do, I think, are reflective of the kind of society we want to create. And we're only a very, very small part of it. And obviously, for, for the majority of people out there, football is only a very small part of their, their lives. So if they can spare a small part of that small part for Wanderers, I hope they'll get a lot of joy out of it and seeing us, you know, playing at some really brilliant teams at our level and progressing the next, next level and the next level and the next level. Um, and their support will obviously has a much greater impact to grassroots clubs. So if you think about, you know, the, the kind of crowds you get at the Emirates or at uh, Etihad or wherever, when it's 60, 50,000, you know, one person cheering makes no difference really. But if you get one person cheering at the side of a Wanderers match, people's heads raise up, their chests puff out. It's a huge boost for them. And so we really hope people will see what we do and believe in what we do and then come and decide that, that, that you know, they want to serve as a bit of support. Great, thank you. I, you know, that really does sum it up well. And it sounds like you've got a great thing going on right now at the club. That's the plan. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for watching this interview. And I hope you've learned something from it about the running of a football club and the resurrection of Wanderers FC. And of course, a big thank you goes out from myself to Mark Wilson for agreeing to speak with me. It was a very interesting chat. And I think he's got something very special going on down there in South London right now. The four points, a giver, idealist, guardian and winner all sum up the club really nicely and it shows what they really are about. Now of course, if you haven't seen my original video, as I said earlier on in this video, please make sure to go and check that out and there will be a link to it down below in the description. 
once more if you did enjoy please make sure to like subscribe share and comment and i'll see you in the next one bye